aside from glyphosate, are you concerned that other chemicals and pesticides and insecticides and fungicides and herbicides are harming our health? And Jeffrey, are there any lessons from the COVID-19 outbreak, outbreak that we could apply to your work? Why don't I go first, Stephanie, because it's right on this thing. Good. The, the timing of the pandemic is perfect for our Protect Nature Now um, plans because it alerted people to two fundamental things. One, microbes can travel around the world and wreak havoc. So we need to pay attention to those. And two, that if there's a pandemic, it can be real and it could cause devastation, health, economy, environment, everything. So we're calling for two things, no genetic enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens coming right off of the pandemic should be easy. Two, while we're at it, let's learn the lesson and don't release any genetically engineered microbes. We know that they'll travel everywhere. We know we can't control them once they're out. And if you really wanna know what it can do, watch the film. It's this level of destruction can be catastrophic or cataclysmic, pick, take your pick. So those are lessons we have. It's one of the silver linings, oddly, of the pandemic in that it helps us stop an existential threat that could be devastating for planetary survival. So this is a window and it happens, it just happens to come at the exact same time where we have made gene editing so cheap and easy, we've democratized the gene pool. So that if you have a lab, you can, you can name and release a genetically modified microbe every day of the year, and you can multiply that by everyone who's now, who's gonna be doing the same kind of thing at high school biology classes, at college biology classes, and then there's these robots being driven by artificial intelligence and these large corporations that are producing all sorts of combinations. The potential for release in the next generation is breathtaking. The potential for damage is absolute. And the pandemic gives us the window to fulfill the unmet need of doing something to protect us on the microbial level. Stephanie? <laughs> Yes, well, of course, I am worried about all the toxic chemicals, and there are so many that it's just a daunting thought to think about getting rid of them all. Um, you know, Tyrone Hayes is a person who's been an expert on atrazine, and he's brought the awareness of atrazine's amazing effects on the reproductive system. It can basically turn male frogs into female frogs. It has tremendous uh, endocrine disrupting effects. And of course, he got harassed also by the industry. They tried to discredit him. They even threatened, I think, his family. So he's had a tough time coping with the um, backlash from his uh, experiments that have shown very clearly that atrazine is extremely toxic. I singled in on, on glyphosate mostly because it is the, by far the most used herbicide on the planet. The United States uses much more than other countries. We have 20% of the glyphosate in the world with only 4% of the world's population. So we're getting exposed much more than other countries are. And glyphosate has been heralded as being such a wonderful chemical because it's so safe. So the combination, and of course we use it on our yards to, to get rid of our dandelions. So people are unaware of the toxicity of glyphosate, which makes it, in my opinion, much more dangerous. Many chemicals are out, are out there that are probably equally bad or even worse than glyphosate in terms of their toxic effects. Glyphosate is not acutely toxic. It's actually more subtle. Its toxicity is subtle. That's part of why it's hard to to see that it's happening because it takes time for you to develop the symptoms that it causes as it accumulates in your proteins throughout your body. But these other chemicals, um, you know, we have mercury in our teeth and mercury in our vaccines. Um, the other problem is that glyphosate is synergistically toxic with many, many other chemicals. Mercury is a good example. Um, mercury uh, gets detoxified by being sulfated and in the liver and glyphosate messes up sulfation. Um, activities everywhere in the body. I talk a lot about sulfate in my book, and that's been a, a focus of, of interest of mine even before I encountered glyphosate. Um, glyphosate messes up the entire sulfur system, and part of that is the ability to detoxify uh, a chemical, uh, toxic metals like, like mercury. And, um, and then of course, there's um, all the plastics, you know, those are endocrine disruptors and there's all the insecticides, you know, the, the bees are dying. The bees, I think it's synergistic toxicity between the insecticide, the, the um, chlorpyrifos and um, glyphosate working synergistically to kill the bees and, uh, and the butterflies. I mean, it's just, um, 
there's so many toxic chemicals out there that it's kind of a nightmare to think about cleaning them all up. Right now, glyphosate is failing as an herbicide in many parts of the country because um, the weeds have gotten resistant. This is partly because of the GMOs and the weeds have become clever and they, they don't, you need more glyphosate to kill them. That's one of the big reasons why the rates kept going up. Um, now they're offering new products that are glyphosate plus. And so they've got a glyphosate plus glufosinate. I think that's, I think it's called Liberty or something. There's a product out glyphosate plus glufosinate. And then they have a glufosinate GMO to go with that. So they've got the double gene editing in the plant to resist both glyphosate and glufosinate, and then to put both of them into the product uh, to help uh, control the weeds that glyphosate isn't killing anymore. Glufosinate is, a, is an amino acid analog of glutamate. And I suspect it's gonna have a similar mechanism of toxicity as glyphosate, except it's gonna be a different amino acid. Glufosinate will substitute for glutamate during protein synthesis and cause a whole other set of, of diseases that we can't even imagine right now. It's already been shown that glufosinate is linked to uh, microcephaly in infants. So, um, you know, we, we really have to, we can't just get rid of glyphosate and replace it with glufosinate or replace it with 2,4-D. That's a, a, a chemical that was in Agent Orange in Vietnam. That's another one that they use. All the herbicides are, are very, very toxic. We have to abandon the whole concept of using herbicides to control weeds. We really have to find another way. And I think technology can help there. I know someone who's, who's been developing a tractor that's like solar based, solar driven and self-driving and it can and it can actually kill weeds in, in a way that doesn't involve toxic chemicals. It has vision so it can actually recognize where the weeds are. I mean, we can use smart robotic technology potentially to help us solve the, the human labor problem because the, once you have, once you abandon toxic chemicals, it, it takes a lot of human labor to control weeds. And that's the big problem that we've gotten lazy. Our farmers don't, can't imagine going back to the way they used to do business with the weeds. And, and we need to find, we could hopefully find some kind of a technology solution that would, um, would make it possible to not use chemicals to kill the weeds and, and then get a much healthier uh, crop and a much healthier food supply. Jeffrey. Yes. What is the status of GMO fish what are the concerns of this? And also, um, separately, um, if a mistake is made and a genetically modified food or organism is released into nature, how long will it last before it goes back to how it was before? And then Stephanie, please discuss the role of biotechnology or agriculture technology as they relate to plant breeding, biodiversity, genetic engineering, pesticide management, soil management, water management, and animal management. How have advances in these fields developed in a positive manner? What potential pitfalls may exist as a result of further development? Whoa. <laughs> uh, why don't you go first? <laughs> All right. So um, how soon will a GMO revert back you know, the, the biotech industry claim that GMOs will have a survival disadvantage and so they'll never survive and thrive. Well, actually it turns out sometimes they have a survival advantage. Uh, certain plants have higher numbers of seeds or, or they took a fish that had a, that had a higher um, mating rate than the natural fish, a Japanese madaka and in they put a computer model together and say, what would happen if we released 60 fish in a population of 60,000 and were shocked that under one of the scenarios, there was complete extinction in 40 generations. Um, sometimes when you release a genetically engineered insect, the trait that you've bred into that insect or you've, you've inserted will go silent. Uh, sometimes it'll transfer to another species. It's possible that you can have horizontal gene transfer between a plant and fungus. Um, there's all sorts of ways that when you release a GMO, it can't revert. Once it's gone, it's gone, but it may change. Uh, there's something called gene drives where they, they put a mechanism into the DNA, which takes your desired trait and puts it on both chromosomes. So the offspring, all the offspring get the trait. 
normally you have half the offspring from the mother, half the offspring from half the genes from the mother, half the genes from the father will get the trait. So by the time you're into the fourth generation, you have one out of eight have that trait. With gene drives, you pass it through every offspring. The entire family tree has that. And they're using it, they want to use it to wipe out certain insects, wipe out mice or rats, wipe out things that they don't like in certain ecosystems. What if that gene transfers to another species and wipes it out? Or what happens if that part silences, but there's something else that makes it actually more virulent, more dangerous, more toxic, and that gets spread. So now you're actually doing the opposite. Instead of pretending that your GMO will somehow disappear, now you're planning for your GMO to become a permanent part of that species or to wipe out that species. So that answers that question. As far as genetically engineered fish go, there's a genetically engineered salmon that's engineered to grow quicker. Uh, normally salmon will have a growth hormone turned on for part of the year and turned off for part of the year. But they took this salmon and they put in a gene from a different salmon and a gene from an Arctic eel that will drive continuous expression of that growth hormone. So in 18 months, theoretically, the salmon can go to market instead of three years. And they claim, oh, this is great for economics, of course, but also great for the environment because you don't have to uh, have the environmental impact uh, from growing salmon in these farms. They want to do it in, in tanks um, inside the mainland to prevent them from escaping. Well, first of all, the research on the health effects of the salmon was so bad, they used six fish, which means that the statistical power was so small that even a 50% increase in an allergic reaction or a toxin or, an, or, or a hormone and a 20% increase in reactivity was considered statistically insignificant. So there was suggested evidence that it creates a hormone that's linked to cancer, IGF-1. There's suggested evidence that those that are allergic to salmon have a higher reaction and that there's other problems health-wise, but there hasn't been any comprehensive study and we're not gonna have any tracking or post-marketing surveillance. They are growing the eggs in Prince Edward Island uh, in Canada, but they now have a facility approved in Indiana and they expect to go to market this year with genetically engineered salmon. I understand it will be labeled as such if it's sold in supermarkets, but not if it's sold in restaurants or in a catering operation, which is how it was sold in Canada when it was available there for a year or two. Um, it will be uh, grown in tanks as far as their plans are, but once the seeds become available, it can be purchased and used all over the world. And what happens if it gets out into the ocean? I think there's about 2 million escapes per year in North America from farm-raised fish or just maybe just the salmon. Now, there was a study done on a similar genetically engineered fast-growing salmon by some Canadian scientists. So it wasn't the Aqua Bounty specific patented Salmon, it was a different one. I think they used pretty much the same concept of fast growing uh, uh, growth hormones. Now, when they put these in tanks just with their own GMOs or mixed it with the natural and there was enough food, everything was fine. When they reduced the amount of food, the frankenfish freaked. Remember, they're growing fast, which means they're, they're eating a lot, which means if they're not getting their food, they may be voracious. And so they became very aggressive and cannibalistic. And there were population crashes and extinctions in all the tanks. Now imagine if that if they get out with the same type of trait. Now you have roving bands of voracious, aggressive salmon killing off other salmon and other species. It could potentially wipe out salmon or wipe out other species. And good luck in trying to do a recall from the ocean. 
So there's at least 35 different genetically engineered fish somewhere in the pipeline, somewhere in the world. And this, if we can stop the salmon, then we might be able to put a cork in that pipeline. Well, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the biotech industry as with respect to biofuels, because that's something that I've been very interested in. And I think that, you know, we're, we have this notion that if we can replace um, fossil fuels with, with fuels that are derived from plants that we grow today, that we're somehow doing something good as far as fighting the global climate change. And, but it's looking like that that's not true. This is another one of these things where they're actually miscalculating what it takes to, to, to make those biofuels, all the extra energy that it takes to grow those crops that you're using to turn into, you know, biodiesel, bioethanol, biogas, and um, even bio home he heating oil and uh, a aviation biofuel. We have all these bio versions of fuels that are coming out. And actually that industry is growing uh, rapidly in the last few years, really ramping up uh, in, in the United States. And it's one of those answers to supposed answers to global climate change alongside wind, wind power and, and solar. We don't hear so much about the bio industry, biofuel industry, but I'm concerned about it in part because of glyphosate, because when you look at all the sources that go into making these biofuels, every single one of them is gonna be glyphosate contaminated. And I mentioned earlier where they just spray the wheat crop with um, glyphosate right before harvest. They harvest the wheat and then they take the stubble that's left behind and ship it on a barge down to say New York City and run it through with this big plant where it gets processed into you know, biofuels, biodiesel and biogas, um, bioethanol. Uh, New York City is actually a, a major leader in the biofuel industry, and they've got an amazing um, operation with these digester eggs that are uh, near where they have the sewage system. So they've got all the sewage sludge, everything coming in from the New York City sewage, and then they add to it other things, you know, other uh, sources of, of fuel that are uh, waste products from, like, for example, waste oil from cooking, waste cooking oil. And then um, various uh, products that come from the, the fields that I mentioned, you know, sometimes you can grow a crop specifically as a biofuel. Um, in fact, corn, for example, is turned into bioethanol. That's corn that's taken away from the table. So we're actually, you know, losing that, that as a food crop when we use it for biofuel. But all of these crops, the wheat, the corn, canola is another one that can be grown just as a, as a fuel crop. Those are, those are uh, all, all exposed to glyphosate and sugarcane is another one. So all these crops that they're using to produce these biofuels have glyphosate in them. And I have had a theory that this could be a factor in COVID-19. And I'm seeing that the cities where they got hit really hard by COVID-19 are cities that have, um, that are leaders in the biofuel industry. And, um, and I can point to New York City in that respect because of this effort they've put into this converting sewage into useful fuel. It feels like a good concept. You know, and it's interesting to look at the history of sewage actually, because they used to just dump it into the ocean and then they realized it was killing the fish. And so then they started dumping it on the land, you know, so landfill, and then, you know, that's got toxic issues too. So now if they just burn it up as fuel, maybe that's a way to clear all the toxic stuff. But what happens if it doesn't actually get burned and if it escapes, you know, into the air before it gets burned? I think that's a serious concern. And in fact, there was a study that just came out in Brazil where they, they found glyphosate in nanoparticles in the air. And they found higher levels of glyphosate in the city compared to the agricultural areas where they were using growing crops that were being sprayed with, with glyphosate. And, I, and Brazil is a leader in the biofuel industry. They have very advanced... Um, bioethanol uses, they, they, they convert sugarcane to bioethanol. And of course, sugarcane is sprayed right before harvest with glyphosate. And then they have designed trucks that can run on almost 100% bioethanol. So I suspect that Brazil is getting, and they have, of course, a, a crisis with COVID-19. I think the countries that are hit hard, hardest by COVID-19 in many cases align with countries that are using a lot of glyphosate and making a lot of biofuel. For both of you, just to be clear, can we definitely feed the world without chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, GMOs? Is that realistic? That we can do it all with organic farming? You want to go first? <laughs> sure. 
Um, yes, we can. Um, I have taught, I've interviewed experts. Um, let me make it clearer. I think it was 2008 where the United Nations and uh, other organizations sponsored the IAA STD report. It was basically the most comprehensive evaluation of agriculture and what agriculture could feed the world. And they had over 460 scientists around the world um, work for years on this. They, as a group, I, I interviewed the co-chairman of this. I interviewed the chairman of different regions because they had books coming out for different continents. I interviewed several of the key players. And first of all, they dismissed GMOs completely as worthless. One of the, the other co-chairmen that I didn't interview described it as a, a, a solution looking for a problem. In other words, it didn't fit anywhere. They didn't see any of evidence that it was of any use whatsoever. And these were the world's experts at feeding the world. They determined that the way to do it was something called um, uh, agro, agroecology, which is growing according to appropriate technologies in the area, appropriate um, crop mixtures and whatnot. And they pointed out in great detail how agroecology helps everything. It produces enough food, it improves the economy, it improves the health, it improves the soil, it improves the environment, it improves the happiness factor mm -hmm. of the people who are doing it. And yet what it doesn't improve is the bottom line of big ag, mm -hmm. because big ag runs on inputs from the outside that they own and have to sell. And big ag has a strong say in what government policy is around the world. And even though most of the food that feeds the world comes from small farms and that small farms turn out to be more efficient and according to the Rodale Institute side-by-side -side study of soy and corn that was GMO versus organic, there was no change in, no significant difference in the yield and on the times when there was drought, the, out, the organic outperformed the GMOs clearly. In spite of that, there's government policy to drive big business and GMOs, not just in here, but in the European Union and elsewhere. So even though science points to agroecology, small farms, et cetera, it's not necessarily policy. Thanks. And so, okay, so I would really, um, the one thing that uh, became clear with the GMOs is when they first rolled them out back in the early, just at the turn of the century, the first year that they used them, they actually did have a substantial increase in yield. And then the second year, the yield increase went down. And eventually by the fourth or fifth year, they reversed. So they had a yield loss because every time you grow the crop, uh, this way, you make the soil worse and worse and worse. So by the time you're done with poisoning the, the microbes in the soil so many years, and the glyphosate actually accumulates. A study in Brazil showed that the glyphosate was accumulating year by year in, in a crop that was being sprayed every year. It's, it's often slow to break down. And the glyphosate is killing off the soil bacteria just as it kills off the uh, gut bacteria and it's messing up the uh, uh, it's decreasing the amount of organic matter in the soil which is making it erode more easily making it not be able to hold water so you end up as you say more susceptible to drought and the soil is getting erosion when you erode uh, the topsoil that's a very very serious problem eventually the soil is just wrecked and it can't grow anything there's a lovely book written by a, a farmer called Gabe Brown um, that I really enjoyed and I, I, I talked about him in my book and um, you know, and he had inherited a farm from his father-in-law and it was a mess because it had been used, growing GMO Roundup Ready corn for many years. And he's just had to li let it lie fallow and let the weeds grow because it just, it was so, the soil was so bad. He had a couple, uh, three years in a row of drought 
Um, and he, and, and when that happened, as the weeds were growing, they were actually fixing his soil. And so he, he, he couldn't afford glyphosate. So he used less because he was so poor. And eventually he realized that he was better off without it. He kind of eventually converted it to a, a healthy, sustainable, renewable farm, growing a variety of different crops, you know, sort of more like the small foot family farm and wrote about this in his book, a very lovely book where he talked about how you can maintain you know, improve the soil. You should be able to improve the soil every year. And a critical thing is to grow a cover crop during the off season. The way that it works with the GMOs is you spray the crop with glyphosate right before harvest. And that's also gonna take care of the weeds. So that your, your land is just barren over the winter. And then you, you plant your crop in the spring, but it's much, much more effective to, to put it. And in fact, a, a rich cover crop, he talked about many different species, not just a single species of cro cover crop, but a whole bunch of different things uh, growing over the winter season. Um, helps to fix the soil, renew the soil, make it healthier. And then when, in the spring, you've got a much better um, head start for the farm. And you can actually just mash the cover crop down uh, and then puncture your seeds through. And the cover crop can actually serve as a protective barrier to prevent the weeds from growing. So it's quite, the, people are learning really interesting techniques to grow food organically and efficiently. And you get not only better yield, but you also get better quality, a lot more nutrients because glyphosate disrupts the uptake of all the minerals into the plant, just as it does, it, it, it messes up the minerals in our bodies. It also messes up the minerals in the plants. And so the plants become severely depleted. In fact, Don Huber showed a tremendous loss in sulfur uptake in the plants among many other uh, critical minerals, but that's gonna start you off with the sulfur deficiency problem if you're eating these foods. So the foods that are coming out of organic are much more nutritious. And I think also if you're eating, eating impoverished foods with missing nutrients, missing micronutrients, that's a driver towards obesity as well. And I didn't mention that earlier, but because um, you have to eat more food in order to get enough of those critical vitamins and minerals if your food is very uh, deficient in those vitamins and minerals. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, is global climate change. I actually get frustrated that it's so rarely mentioned that agriculture plays a role in global, global climate change. I don't know how big a role. There are a few papers that are starting to recognize that that's the case. Um, I see glyphosate as a major contributor. Glyphosate interferes with the uptake of nitrate. It messes up the soil bacteria that, that allow the plant to take up nitrates. And so the solution is just to use lots of nitrates. As, you know, They use these nitrate fertilizers which of course um, end up getting washed. The plant can't take it up, so it gets washed off into the waterways. And then it actually turns into nitrous. First of all, it fuels all these you know, algae overgrowth. You get problems with cyanobacteria and blue-green um, blue algae. Those are um, problematic in the, um, in the waterways. We're having a lot of problems with the, these toxic releases from these algae and also blocking, they block the sun. And so you get this, um, they, they eat up all the nutrients. So you have below this hypoxic zone, below this huge growth of these uh, algae, where um, you end up with the nitric ox nitrate turning into nitrous oxide, getting reduced into nitrous oxide in this oxygen depleted environment. Nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas that's more than 100 times worse than carbon dioxide. And so I think there's a big problem with uh, excess release of nitrous oxide as a consequence of glyphosate and probably also methane. Like, you know, they talk about cows produce a lot of methane and, um, and that's bad for the environment. Therefore we shouldn't eat cows, but the cows that are grown on the grass are much healthier. Uh, the, I think glyphosate is disrupting the enzymes that take methane, methane back into organic matter in the gut, the gut actually produces methane and then takes it back and turns it back into very healthy organic uh, food for the host. And I think those enzymes are disrupted by glyphosate. So you get excess methane, ex ex excess nitrous oxide, both of which are much, much worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And on top of that, glyphosate disrupts. There's several papers I found that talked about glyphosate suppressing an enzyme called Rubisco which is the biggest, it's the most common enzyme in the world. Huge amounts of Rubisco are in all the plants that, that have chlorophyll that produce, that can take sunlight and capture carbon dioxide and make organic matter out of it. That enzyme is suppressed by glyphosate, which means that the carbon dioxide is not being pulled out of the air as readily as it should be, as it would be under normal circumstances and getting put into the ground. The plants are very capable of capturing carbon from the air and turning it into organic matter and putting it into the soil. And that's a way to remove carbon dioxide and reverse climate change. So I think if we were to reverse our agricultural practices, 
away from chemical-based agriculture and towards uh, sustainable, even renewable organic, where we really work hard on improving the soil, not just sustaining it, but improving the soil. I think we would actually reverse climate change, not just halt it, but reverse it. And I think it's extremely important that we consider that aspect of agriculture. Stephanie, I, I love your very thorough, detailed information on this. Uh, there's a lot of things in there that I was not aware of. One that I wasn't aware of, but I question is about the first year of planting GMOs increase the yield. There was a study in University of Nebraska on soybeans showing a yield drag of about six or 7% from the soybeans. The BT toxin corn does have an increase in yield uh, when there is an infestation of the corn borer in a particular location because it's designed to kill the corn borer. So you can have a 15% increase in that particular area in because it doesn't come every year, it just comes occasionally mm -hmm. in certain places. So it's kind of like insurance in case it comes, you have your protected. But on average, the yield was almost negligible. There was an in, a decrease in the use of herbicide for the first two, three years. And then there was an increase. Um, and we also know that the biotech industry, particularly Monsanto, purchased all these different seed companies and removed the higher performing seeds from the non-GMO category. So if you were using a certain variety for your land and it was time to start you know, deciding whether you wanted to buy GMOs because it was in the late 90s, you'd find that the high variety, high performing variety was no longer available as a non-GMO. It was only available mm. as a GMO. So that artificially mm, that's promoted, promoted that. So that's a good I trick. Yeah, I don't think that the, except in the case of the corn borer and the BT toxin, mm -hmm. I don't think the generic uh, GMO will increase yield uh, because yield requires a whole combination of a lot of different genes to function in an orchestrated way. There's very, very, very few traits that it's one gene can produce that trait. And they got lucky with herbicide tolerant, Roundup Ready products, as well as BT toxin. But in order, they have not even tried to create a, a crop that has inherent increased yield because of the changes of the genes. It's far more complicated than they have access to. They've, they've argued strongly that, that glyphosate has, uh, the whole GMO glyphosate idea has increased yield. But it, it, I remember seeing a paper that showed that it did look like it was doing better the first year, but it slipped every year and got to the point where it was doing worse after a few years. So it's, um, and of course, at the same time, the weeds were getting resistant, so the glyphosate wasn't working as well, and the soil was getting depleted, so that was hurting, working against them too. So the, the crop would get um, fungus infection too and get wiped out completely because it would be more less resistant to disease, infectious diseases. And so all these things would come to bear in the later years as things got worse and worse. Yeah. So in the end, it's not a win. You know, you need to think in terms of the future. When you grow crops, you really want to think about the, the soil and how, how can you keep it nourished and keep it healthy for the next year's crop. And that these chemicals work against that. I love Don Huber's description of how it works in the soil, where it reduces the defenses of the plant, and then it promotes the soil-borne pathogens, which kill the plant. Yes. Uh, and right. so you created, you've created all these pathogens. Uh, you've killed off the beneficial bacteria in the soil, which normally reduces the population growth of the pathogens. Right. Um, you've reduced the ability, you've reduced the defenses of the plant because you've locked up all of its minerals. And you've also blocked the ability to convert more minerals into the plant because that's part of the job of this beneficial bacteria, which has been wiped out. And so now you have all these dangerous pathogens based on fungus that are coming and killing the plants. And that is a perfect thing of what's happening in our gut. You kill exactly, the beneficial same bacteria, thing. the pathogens explode, you're, you're weak, you're, you don't have a defense against it and you get disease. Yeah, it's so interesting how many parallels there are between the gut and the soil. The yeah. soil is sort of the gut of the plant. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs>